We are so grateful to have the Harmony team with us and also Alisa from, uh, from PR UK. Um, I will now pass to Alisa for the brief introduction into, into PR UK. Thank you so much. My name is Alyssa Goodman and I'm a co-director of something called Population Research UK, which is a new UKRI initiative. And uh, the, projects, the project which is uh, bringing you this training this morning was an early investment by UKRI in the PR UK programme. So my role is to tell you a bit more about the wider PR UK programme and what we're doing at the moment. So um, my slot will be about 10 minutes and then I think you'll be excited to get on to the main part of the, the training session, which is about the Harmony tool. So um, as I think many of you know, and many of you are actively working in this area, uh, the UK supports an unparalleled collection of longitudinal population studies and resources. And uh, PR UK is here to help maximize the benefit of these resources by promoting a research environment with high quality interconnected services that are designed for diverse needs and communities. And um, we're aiming to make enhancements to data discovery, to access and linkage of longitudinal population studies, and to support coordination and advocacy and training. And we have this dream or vision that a, um, a researcher or perhaps an evidence user coming from a completely different environment or planet even with only his research question in mind could um, easily find and make best use of all the appropriate available assets because uh, of the work that we do. And we're here also to advocate and provide a voice for our longitudinal population studies community. So just to, you, we're not starting from a blank sheet here. There are many wonderful um, assets that uh, the community already has that join us up and coordinate and do good work. Um, and also there's many uh, scientific collaborations using multiple longitudinal population studies in coordination with one another for huge scientific gain. And um, I thought I'd just give a few exemplars on the research side of what happens when um, studies come together. And uh, given uh, we're talking about the Harmony tool today, I thought I'd start with um, some of the products of good uh, harmonization across longitudinal population studies. What can we achieve? Um, so one really strong ex example here is from the CLOSER consortium that many of you may be aware of and engage with already. Uh, and some of the uh, harmonization work that they did, for example, on, um, on body weight and uh, uh, composition uh, using multiple cohorts in the UK. And here's some of their research findings showing really um, stark increases in the percentages of the populations who are overweight and obese in generations born um, more recently compared to older ones. Uh, another strong exemplar of studies coming together to produce good research came from uh, during the pandemic. For example, um, uh, many in my team, in fact, including Bettina, were involved in the National Core Studies program that used multiple cohorts uh, to answer important questions quickly, uh, both in terms of society and in terms of health. And here there's some exemplars around the impact of the furlough. And there's many amazing international efforts as well. So I'm a huge fan of the Global Aging Gateway that brings together health and retirement studies around the world. Um, including in, um, in from the UK. Um, so we, as I say, are uh, operating in a, in a really rich environment of studies and, um, and already existing infrastructure. So this map just provides you some sense of some of that. Um, we came um, from a long process by the funders starting with a population research resource steering group back in 2018 uh, that started to consult with the communities about what they might want from something like Population Research UK. And then there was um, something called the Prospectus that was commissioned by the funders and undertaken by HDR UK, which set out some pretty clear terms of reference for what Population Research UK would look like 
um, and seek to achieve. And then there was a, um, a call for a hub team, uh, which is what uh, myself and my colleagues uh, responded to. So I am part of the PR UK hub um, and uh, we are essentially um, working within this triangle that we call the PR UK in for forum. So we're looking to build a very engaged community of stakeholders working within this longitudinal population studies space. So uh, yourselves, I hope, included. I hope by the end of this, you'll sign up to our mailing list and engage with us. Uh, we're working within a wider data e infrastructure ecosystem and um, in, uh, in a wider policy environment as well. Um, so we have the hub team and the forum and then these work streams. So we, after the HDR UK prospectus, it was determined that PR UK would um, have a hub and previously they were called spokes, but then we were told to call them work streams. So we are a hub and work streams model <laughs> and our five work streams are data discovery, data access, data linkage, coordination and advocacy uh, and training. And then we, um, we also have a collaboration and innovation fund that we can use a bit more flexibly, not tied necessarily to those like prescribed work streams. We have a hub team, as I said, um, on the left is the leadership group. So we are a set of um, experienced researchers and in, uh, longitudinal population study leaders and sort of infrastructure um, leads that are already working in this space. Myself and Nick Timpson as co-directors, Andy Boyd, who's director of the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration, and Jenny, Jenny Simons, who's director of CLOSER, are what we call the infrastructure chair. So they're already leads of infrastructure in this space, working closely together with us in PR UK. And then we have a role called forum chairs, which will be a rotating role throughout the five first five years of PR UK. These are um, leaders within the uh, both biomedical and social science communities uh, who are there to help us um, engage and hear the voices of our communities clearly. And what we do on the right hand side is our we're building team um, mainly based at the University of Bristol that are um, carrying out the program of PR UK. So um, where are we at in terms of what we're actually doing? Um, there are two initiation um, phases that we're working our way through in order to um, commission uh, some services uh, within the work streams that I've described. We're going to have around £7 million to either spend or commission across the five years. We're nearly one year in, so it'll be a four, over four years that we'll be spending it. Uh, but we're currently squarely in phase one, which is consultation, aiming to identify priority areas, um, starting with the PR UK prospectus, but then refining those. We've done five in-person workshops around the UK and one online, um, and we're wrapping up this phase now. I'll say a bit more then about what will happen next, but essentially we'll be moving to um, engaging with potential solution providers uh, who we may then commission to undertake a set of activities that are going to improve the infrastructure in this space. Um, and then we'll have, um, we'll be actually spending the money uh, probably starting from spring-ish of 2025, perhaps summer, the timetable's being developed now. Um, I just wanted to, before I finish, I just wanted to give you a substantive idea of the sorts of things we've been consulting uh, with our communities about in these workshops. So I just picked two of the work streams that I thought would be most relevant to this workshop um, because of the topic of the training today. So I, I, um, I started here with discovery and on the left, we have like a sort of vision statement for what we're looking to achieve within the area of data discovery across um, our PR UK program. Uh, and then on the right hand side, some options that we think might be worthwhile um, investments for us uh, that we'll be, we've been using as the basis of discussion. And then within our workshops, our participants have been like adding things to these lists and ranking them and stuff like that. So for discovery, just for example, 
we would like to see an inclusive suite of discovery functions that is low burden for longitudinal population studies and users, providing an intuitive user experience, supporting discovery needs across the project life cycle, and including, including discovery of studies and data. So, and things that we might uh, try and achieve to do to enhance that, we already have a lot of wonderful discovery tools, including Harmony, Closer Discovery, um, many others. Um, for example, we're thinking of commissioning a website which lists all UK longitudinal population studies with the minimum metadata uh, powering that and um, looking to federate study metadata for longitudinal population studies so the, the different um, tools can speak to each other uh, easily. And if you upload your metadata into one, it feeds metadata into another. Um, so I'll just say one, give one more, and then I think I need to stop presenting. Uh, oh, I had two more, in fact, coordination and advocacy, but I will skip that and just mention training because this is a training session. So um, we're looking to see a coordinated set of training and education resources for longitudinal population studies users and data service professionals. Um, training could be about longitudinal population study design and management analysis, data discovery, linkage and knowledge mobilization. So some of our role will be a signposting approach. Again, what's out there already and trying to amplify the impact of the great things that are already going on. Uh, we think that there are gaps in training in terms of using trusted research environments and the types of things um, that increasingly complex things that people are using within them, like multimodal data, linked data, the potential for synthetic um, training data we think is great in our community, training for open science and statistical methods. So there's still the opportunity for you to contribute. The workshop phase has finished, but you can email us on info at pruk.ac.uk. You can go to the consultation page on the PRUK website, and there's a contact sheet there. And I'd be really keen for you to subscribe to our mailing list. So I'll try, I'll put the, in the chat, if I'm allowed by the organizers, um, how the link to where you could um, join that. And thank you so much to, to uh, Christina and colleagues for allowing me to present this morning. So without further ado, I won't take too much because I know everyone's very excited to hear about Harmony. So I'll just give a very brief introduction to the project that, that brought us all together today. Um, firstly, I am Christina Mazur. I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service, and I wear different hats. Um, but the main two ones are acquiring and negotiating data for the UK Data Service curated and research repositories, and the second being leading on the training um, and support portfolio for data creators, so events like the one today. Um, we would like to give um, clear acknowledgement to our funders, so this would have not been possible without the Economic and Social Research Council and the Medical Research Council, and as Alisa was saying, Population Research UK. We are most grateful to the Harmony tool, and we have uh, Bettina, Owen, and Thomas on the call today to tell us more about Harmony. Um, of course, many thanks to, to Alisa for joining us today, and we would also like to recognize Ida Sanchez from CLS UCL for her significant contributions in sharing insights and expertise. Now, our project started back in October of 2023. Um, it was a very initial exploration of what type of training is needed for the data management community in longitudinal population studies. Um, you can visit the UKDS project page. We have information about the project and we will be making all the materials available there as well. The project did consist of a very systematic and stepped approach because we really wanted to understand first and foremost what is out there. There's no point in reinventing the wheel, is there? So we did an audit of existing training resources and with the training courses that we have done, we've built on them. Then we wanted to understand from the LPS data management community, what are some gaps? What are some training sources that don't necessarily provide what they are expecting to, to provide. Well, it became clear not only via our survey, we have also done some 
um, I would say semi-structured interviews um, or unstructured interviews, better said, and we had a workshop as well. And it became clear there is a need for an introductory type um, a session. And what we have done, we have done 10 introductory sessions that cover the very basics when it comes to research data management. So from fair and care principles to ethical and legal considerations to documenting data, formatting and also anonymizing data as well. And we've talked about data sharing practices and best practices and guidelines, for example, using responsible repositories, trusted research environments, and actually leveraging existing license and access frameworks. Uh, we've then moved on onto our focus session, so one of them being today on harmonization. We've also done one on synthetic data, and I'm very glad that Alisa mentioned how important synthetic data is. This feels to be the next step into the landscape of further opening up, especially LPS data, because it's very granular, very rich, and sometimes it needs to sit besides some quite closed access barriers. But if we can make synthetic data available more widely, that's, a, that's, a, that's the next step in a good direction. All of the materials will be available as open access. We're really keen. We are making them available under Creative Commons licenses because we're really keen for you to adapt the materials and use them within your organization for training and development purposes. And at the very end, we do have a lessons learned report that focuses on not only what we've done, but what are some additional discoveries by talking with data managers, by talking with PIs from the different LPSs, what are some other work streams that are needed? Now, very briefly, I wouldn't be the data collections development manager at UKDS if I wouldn't take all the opportunities to just briefly discuss what we do at UK Data Service. So we host the largest collection of social, economic and population research data, but it's not only about providing access to this data, it's about providing support and that's a, a double-edged sword, not only to data users, so secondary researchers, but also to data creators to support them in making available this fair data for future reuse. We are a partnership between different organizations Myself and Gail on the call, we are based at UK Data Archive at University of Essex, but we have colleagues at University of Manchester, Katie Marsh Institute, um, and they have helped us with the synthetic um, data um, workshop. GISC and EDINA, GISC focuses on impact and macro data. Um, EDINA and UCL colleagues um, focus a lot on census data. We are here to support the development of best practices for data preservation and sharing. Um, we have around 9,700 data collections in our repositories, and over a thousand of those are cohort and longitudinal studies. Uh, we acquire around 250 new data collections and new editions per year, and we have roughly 48,000 registered users that account for 130,000 data accesses worldwide per year. Um, now, numbers are great, but to put this in practice, every six minutes, someone accesses data from UKDS, hoping that makes it more relatable. Now, in terms of today's session, we have a few learning objectives. So we hope that you're discovering PR UK and its role in supporting longitudinal population studies, but also if you're unaware of UKDS, how we contribute to promote and also share fair and responsible data sharing. And then we move on to our colleagues from the Harmony team, and we hope you're going to develop a foundational understanding of data harmonization, particularly in the context of longitudinal population studies. Learn how the Harmony data tool facilitates the harmonization of data sets through its web interface, R, Python, and also the API functionalities. We were just chatting before everyone joined how fantastic of a tool this is because it offers such great functionality for everyone. You don't need to know code to use it. You can use the web interface. Why wouldn't we do that? Like, that's just fantastic. Um, I am so delighted with this tool, Bettina, so I will keep saying it over and over again. Um, and also understand how the Harmony data tool supports more reliable data harmonization workflows and enabling robust secondary research and cross-population comparison. Um, so today's program, we've hit the brief population research UK introduction 
introduction. Thank you once again, Alisa. We've done the PR UK, UKDS um, skills development for managing longitudinal data for sharing project. And we're moving on to talking about harmonization, specifically the Harmony Data tool. Then we're going to have some demos which you can follow and try yourself as well. We do have a break. We don't want anyone to have a strained back. So we're going to have a break in between the in between the demos. And then we're going to have an interactive Q&A. Please do put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we are going to, to pick them up at, at, at the end. So please don't hesitate to put any questions. Or again, if you struggle with anything, do put it in the chat and we can we can help. Thank you ever so much. And I shall now pass to the Harmony team. Brilliant. Uh, well, thanks so much, Christina, for uh, the invite to come and uh, speak today and your very kind words about the Harmony tool uh, and also thanks to the to the UK data service for for having us today um so yeah hello everybody it's great to see so many uh people here um especially on a, on a Friday morning um uh so today uh yeah we're going to be talking about uh, data harmonization uh particularly using the harmony tool so uh, my name is Owen McElroy I'm a lecturer in the school of psychology at Ulster University in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, my research uh, typically uses longitudinal population surveys. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the measurement and development of child and adolescent mental health. Uh, and I've worked on a number of harmonization projects over the years. Um, also with me today is Thomas Wood from Fast Data Science. Uh, Thomas is the uh, data scientist who uh, helped, uh, uh, who built the Harmony tool. Um, so Thomas is here to uh, showcase some of the more technical aspects uh, that are that are well beyond me. Uh, so it's great to have Thomas here. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Bettina Moltrecht uh, from the Centre for Longitudinal Studies at UCL. So uh, Bettina and myself have been uh, co-leading the Harmony project over the past uh, couple of years in its in its different incarnations. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, the, the Harmony team, uh, as I mentioned, myself and Bettina have been uh, co-leading the project. Uh, the team itself uh, has, has changed a bit over the last couple of years and lots of people have contributed to the project, probably too many to uh, list. But here we have kind of the, the core team as it would stand. Uh, so myself, Bettina Thomas, uh, in our most recent round of funding, uh, we've uh, been partnering with Louise Arsenal uh, from the, the Catalogue of Mental Health team at King's College London, uh, and Richard Thomas from the UK uh, Longitudinal uh, Linkage Collaboration. Uh, we also have Rachel Gomez, who's joined us as a, as a, a research associate and a, a, a designer um, who's been a fantastic addition to the team as well. So uh, the project itself, Harmony, has been running for uh, a couple of years now. It started early 2022. Um, we were initially funded by uh, the Wellcome Trust as part of their um, mental health data prize. Uh, and uh, we're currently funded by the ESRC as part of the future data services program. And I apologize in advance, I'm going to use the, the word data a lot. I find the term data hard to pronounce in my accent. So uh, hopefully everybody knows what I'm, what I'm talking about throughout this project or throughout this presentation. Uh, brilliant. So um, outline for this session, uh, Christina has already highlighted uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, yeah, a coffee break about halfway through uh, the Q and A. What we might do is uh, to, to to stop the the questions. Hopefully, there are lots of questions. We don't want them to kind of pile up. So we might at at different points um, kind of work the interactive Q and A throughout. You know, maybe at the end of each each section, we can we can have a look and see if there's any questions. And again, at the end, maybe see if if anybody has has popped anything in there. Um, so yeah, I'll be spending. Um, Quite a bit of today, you know, talking about data harmonization more broadly, because I, I don't think there's any point in 
uh, diving into the harmony tool unless we're all kind of uh, singing from the same uh, hymn sheet in terms of what we mean when we say data harmonization, uh, in term, particularly with uh, relation to longitudinal data. Um, so after that, then we'll be we'll be taking a look at the harmony tool itself. Uh, and it's in its different incarnations. We've got, as, as Christina mentioned, we've got a, a, a very um, user-friendly web interface, uh, but we also have uh, some uh, software packages or Python uh, for those who are, who are most comfortable with that. Um, and I guess at the outset, you know, I, I need to probably make the point that, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, and myself, were very much uh, researchers. So, uh, you know, the way we, I guess, think about data, um, you know, is from that research perspective. But, you know, hopefully what we cover will be also useful to you as data managers in your day-to-day -day management. And, you know, maybe you can think of new and creative ways of using our harmonization tool. And that's something we find that that's uh, you, quite often when we talk about this stuff, we, we get people coming up to us after us, you know, sort of suggesting, oh, could we could it be used for this or that? And uh, so it's great to have a, a kind of new new audience here um, today. So first and foremost, uh, what do we mean by data harmonization? Uh, and this is it's quite a broad term that refers to any process that aims to produce equivalent or comparable measures of a given characteristic across data sets uh, where the data sets come from different either different populations or from the same population but at, at different time points and um, every instance of harmonization is unique uh, the, the kind of strategies you put in place will depend on many factors you know what's the the kind of the overall aim or research question of what you're doing, uh, the availability of data, what type of data can you access, uh, and probably crucially, what type of data are you dealing with will, will have a large impact on the, the kind of the decisions you make. And again, for clarity, uh, I want to differentiate between two types of data harmonization that are related in principle, but are, are quite different in terms of methods. And that's prospective and retrospective harmonization. So with prospective harmonization, uh, comparability is built into the, the research project from the very beginning and, you know, and, and certainly through the data collection stages. So prospective harmonization, you know, usually refers to, you know, if we think of some examples, some large cross-national studies uh, that employ the same design, you know, so similar uh, sampling procedures, but uh, most importantly, similar or the same measurement approaches, say, uh, across countries or, or across time. So, you know, if we think about things like uh, maybe the, the PISA, uh, very large study uh, edu of educational outcomes, um, things like maybe the World Mental Health Surveys, these these large surveys that are, are, are kind of tailored maybe slightly to, to nuances in different countries, but uh, largely share, share similar measures and approaches. Um, if we think about longitudinal studies, which obviously is the focus of today, you know, any longitudinal study where kind of the same measure is, is uh, administered at multiple times could be considered, I guess, a, a prospective form of harmonization. But uh, anybody who works with cohort studies will know that that isn't always the case, that sometimes the, the measures we use change over time. Um, so assuming that all of the, the measures that have been administered can be applied cross-culturally or within individuals over time, this prospect of harmonization pro approach allows us to make direct comparisons uh, across populations. So that could be across countries, looking at a kind of development of, of phenomena within individuals over time. But that's not really what we're here to talk about today. Uh, retrospective harmonization. This uh, involves pooling and integrating data from different sources that were not intentionally designed to be combined. And this is really the, the focus of today. Um, so for example, I'm sure you're all aware of the rich history of uh, longitudinal cohorts in the UK. Um, Alyssa obviously mentioned a few of these during her, her brief talk. Um, and these studies, they often share many similarities, you know, in terms of design. So, you know, similar uh, target populations, they're longitudinal, they are often representative 
and the content, you know, can be broadly quite similar, you know, measuring things like, you know, social health factors, things like that. But men, you know, most of these studies, they're not one-to-one -one replicas of one another. There are many differences that exist between them. You know, when, for instance, uh, when, uh, it, what ages specific assessments took place, um, uh, particularly the measurements that are used, um, you know, different scales are used at different time points within and across these these cohorts. Uh, and again, not just the, the cohorts in CLS, but, you know, UK data more, more broadly. So retrospective harmonization is about taking data such uh, as this, processing it to make it more comparable across sources, uh, pulling that data and then analyzing it. So for the remainder of this presentation today, when we use the term harmonization, it's going to be this uh, retrospective harmonization that we're referring to. Okay, so why bother with any of this? Uh, what are, are kind of the, the benefits of harmonization? Why are we all here today? Well, like any other methodological approach or innovation, the aim is to gain knowledge that mightn't have been possible without this this particular method. So, for example, uh, many research questions that we aim to answer in social and life sciences require quite large sample sizes, uh, and sometimes single studies uh, don't don't cover this or don't don't have enough power. So, harmonization, pooling data from multiple different sources, can help boost our our sample sizes and our, our statistical power. Um, they can also help. Uh, you know, test or, or answer specific research questions, you know, testing uh, cross-country or longitudinal differences. Do, do certain phenomena or patterns we observe in our data, do they apply in different cultures, different contexts across different time points? Um, and harmonization can be a really powerful tool for, for getting at that. Um, I mean, even beyond kind of explicit comparisons across uh, countries, if we think about generalizability, you know, by replicating our, our findings in different samples, this adds further weight to, to the findings that we, uh, we come across. And harmonization fits quite uh, neatly within the FAIR principles, which are widely adopted in, in science, government, industry, um, with the aim of promoting open, open and efficient use of data. So, you know, the FAIR principles, they aim to essentially maximize uh, the value of the data we have by ensuring it's effectively managed and shared. Uh, and harmonization is particularly relevant to um, I think uh, interoperability, uh, so making data kind of standardized and essentially allowing different data sources to 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 be pulled or to talk to one another, uh, and also obviously reusability. Um, you know, we've we've uh, I mean, as a look at the the slide Christina provided, we'll look at the the vast amounts of data we've we've collected in the UK. So I think getting added value from all of the that investment by by reusing it. Um, is is a really useful thing for kind of science and, and societal benefits. Like any method or approach, there are going to be challenges to, to harmonization. Um, what are some of the issues that we can run into? Well, uh, first of all, availability of data. Um, Certain instances, you know, you might you, you you might think harmonization is is possible across uh, certain data sets that you know or you're aware of, um, but if you if you dig a little deeper, maybe just the data unfortunately isn't isn't there. You know, we need at least some kind of common denominator to to be able to to harmonize on. Um, there's also the issue of uh, comparability versus equivalence. So. In the in the measurement literature, you know the, the term equivalence is often used. You know, having uh, you, you know, suggesting that you need completely equivalent uh, measures to be able to 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 undertake comparative research. Um, but this can be you know this can be quite challenging even when uh, the exact same measures have been used in different uh, different populations you know for for kind of pure equivalence we need measures to be in the same language have the same meaning be interpreted uh, in the same way and this is um, often not the case even when similar uh, measures are used um 
so there's a really good uh, book on on uh, harmonization. It's it's in the references at the end. Um, uh, Tomescu, Dobrov, and colleagues, uh, and they pr prefer this term comparability. Um, and basically recognizing that when we're, we're talking about harmonization, we're dealing with a, a kind of a continuum rather than uh, the kind of binary presence or absence of, of equivalence. In other words, um, you know, it, it's about trying to maximize the comparability while also recognizing that we, we might not ever really get a uh, hundred percent equivalence across uh, populations and across time. So again, just, just something to, to consider. Um, Loss of information can be an issue. And um, so, you know, whatever type of harmonization you're, you're doing, you're almost always going to be uh, processing or modifying data in some way to make it more comparable. Um, and this means you often have to kind of converge on the, the lowest common denominator. You know, what, what do these measures, whether it's rescaling or, or uh, binarizing or something like that, how how can we make the kind of the scoring comparable across different measures? And again, this can lead to, to loss of information. So you have this kind of trade-off to always consider, you know, you might increase comparability but lose information or decrease comparability and have further information within studies. Again, these are things I'll come back to in more detail. You know, how can we kind of address these types of issues? Um, and also processor degrees of freedom, processor or, or researcher degrees of freedom. So ultimately, uh, at least the majority of harmonization decisions are, are kind of made by, by researchers or data managers or, or processors. So we have to, you know, and how the decisions that one person might make to, to harmonize data might, might vary across different individuals. Um, and, and there, uh, again, we'll look at different examples that uh, kind of different decisions you might need to make at, at different levels of the, of the process. So obviously this introduces an element of kind of inconsistency in human, not necessarily human error, but uh, again, like I said, different people might have different thoughts, different approaches to, to harmonization. And in many reasons, this is, this is why we developed Harmony, um, is to try and reduce our uh, kind of the, the processor or, or researcher degrees of freedom, or at least, if not reduce that, at least add in an element of kind of consistency and reproducibility into the harmonization process. Okay, so as I mentioned at the outset, every instance of harmonization is unique, but uh, many who have attempted uh, harmonization and describes the process have noted a similar number of steps and, and kind of broad principles. Uh, and these were nicely described by uh, Isabel Fortier in the uh, part of the Maelstrom Consortium, a, a group based in the United States, uh, specializing in, in harmonization. So um, they provided, uh, like I said, these, these kind of broad uh, steps to guide the, the process. So uh, step number one, uh, you know, assembling your, your pre-existing knowledge and selecting the, the studies that you're going to, to harmonize. So this is really about your data discoverability, you know, gathering knowledge on what studies are out there, what studies you, you think can be used to, to answer the research question or whatever particular uh, purpose you have for harmonization. Um, and at this stage, you know, you, you need to consider the comparability maybe of the studies themselves, you know, are, um, you know, are some of the characteristics comparable? Are we dealing with, you know, general population studies here? Or, you know, maybe if you've got uh, good measures or comparable measures in one study, but one, one is a general population study, but the other is a kind of a high risk clinical sample or something like that, you know, that the harmonization there might not be possible from the get go due to those kind of design differences. So that's the type of stuff you want to consider uh, at stage one. Uh, step two, selecting the core variables to be harmonized. So uh, obviously you need uh, very clear definitions of your uh, research question, but also the variables that uh, you, you need to be able to answer that particular question uh, and confirm and, and document whether they're available in uh, the studies you're, you're looking at.
step three, processing the data. So this is, I guess, the real meat and potatoes of harmonization. So develop a strategy for harmonizing your data. Again, this will be probably unique depending on the data you're, you're dealing with. It will, but it will likely involve some sort of uh, uh, data cleaning uh, and recoding of some sort, uh, again, depending on the data, uh, mostly, you know, simple algorithms or transformations uh, of some type can be applied to your data. And we'll cover some examples of this shortly. Estimate the quality of your harmonized variables. So it's not enough just to devise a harmonization strategy and kind of take it at, at face value. Um, as I said, there are these issues around researcher degrees of freedom, about the, the kind of loss of information. So we want to make sure that any harmonized variables that we've derived remain reliable and that they still remain a kind of comprehensive reflection of the core concept they were originally designed to measure so uh, again there's there's many different strategies here you can you can uh, employ to test this empirically and finally uh, disseminate and preserve uh, your your final product so obviously uh oh, apologies uh as the you know the the target audience today are our data managers so uh, obviously this almost goes without saying um but uh yeah the, again the ultimate goal of harmonization is uh, not just to answer a particular research question but also to um help inform others and and share your data and help people you know uh, look at the, the strategies that you put in place and maybe adopt them for their own harmonization projects or else reusing the, the variables that you've derived um, directly. So, you know, throughout the process, we're, we're, we're thinking about things like, you know, clear protocols, uh, describing your, your process from finding the data to recording it, uh, good, clear metal, metadata and, and labeling and things like that. Okay. So that's a, a broad overview of, of what harmonization is in general approaches. Um, I think it's it's best to clarify this with some examples. Um, so let's look at um, a couple of a couple of different examples. Um, so as I said, harmonization really depends on the type of data that you're dealing with. Uh, in some instances, particularly when dealing with objective data, so things maybe that are, are measured uh, objectively using using different in instruments. You know, I'm thinking sort of biological data. Um, uh, you know, the harmonization process here can be reasonably straightforward, uh, or at least. Step three, the kind of processing of the data can, can be straightforward. Um, so as a first example, we're going to look at a piece of work led by um, uh, Professor Rebecca Hardy, who's now at Loughborough. Uh, I was formerly at, at Closer at UCL, um, looking to harmonize uh, height, weight, and, and BMI in um, uh, some of the, the CLS cohorts. Uh, interestingly, uh, Alyssa, I believe, uh, alluded to some of this data earlier, so which is great. And now we can kind of dig into it a little bit um, uh, deeper. So, so yeah, the overall aim here was to take uh, height, weight, and BMI across five British cohorts and, and harmonize it. So what did the, the processing of this data look like? Uh, well, in some of the older birth cohorts, so if we're thinking of, um, for instance, the, the 1946 cohort, uh, the NSHD, you know, study of 5,000 people born in 1946, um, data here were collected and stored using the imperial system. So we're, we're talking about things like uh, inches, pounds, uh, stone, things like that. Uh, I, I never understand that particular system. Um, but... In the younger cohorts, so things like the Millennium Cohort Study, obviously uh, the, the metric system was, was used. So here, you know, we've got this reasonably straightforward uh, processing step, uh, converting, you know, any units, uh, any variables that were in the, the imperial um, metric over to the, uh, the, uh, the metric system. So, you know, if you want to convert from inches to millimeters, you just create a new derived variable where you um, uh, multiply 
inches by I think it's 25.4 or something like that. You'll, you'll have a new variable in millimeters. And but you can see from this, this is the kind of the, the protocol or the steps that were used in that project. You can see that harmonization is more than simply converting variables from one metric to another. There's many other subtle differences in um, how the data were, were organized. Um, so, um, you know, there was a lot of kind of data cleaning involved. Um, the researchers uh, also took a kind of consistent approach to things like, how, you know, how do we deal with missing values? What about things like uh, implausible values? Uh, you know, think, obviously, if, if you know, um, if, if there's somebody weighing 4,000 kilograms or something like that, there, there's probably a, a kind of a typo or something like that. So again, just very clearly uh, describing how, how issues like that were handled in the, in the data. So yeah, I just wanted to show then, once these variables have been derived, they were then uh, obviously um, uh, stored and, and uploaded to the UK data service. So those particularly, uh, th those specific derived variables can be downloaded directly from the UK DS and reused by other people along with all of the metadata and all of the, the kind of the documentation. But I just also wanted to give an idea of how this type of data can actually be used. So uh, this is a paper uh, led by, by David Ban, um, also from UCL, uh, and David and colleagues use these derived variables to explore socioeconomic inequalities in BMI across four of the, the British birth cohorts. Um, so the 1946 cohort, the 1958 cohort, the 1970 cohort, and the Millennium cohort. Um, and their findings suggested a couple of uh, interesting and kind of policy relevant uh, things. So for instance, there appeared to be evidence of a bit of a cohort effect. In other words, uh, BMI was generally uh, higher amongst the, the millennium cohort. Um, but also the BMI gap appeared uh, uh, to change, uh, between, uh, you know, in terms of uh, socioeconomic status or inequalities. In other words, the difference between uh, in BMI between the uh, kind of least disadvantaged and most disadvantaged. If you look at that in the earlier cohorts, there wasn't really much difference between these two groups. It's, uh, but then if you go into the more recent generation, um, not only are, 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 is kind of the millennium generation higher on BMI across the board, but also we have this widening of the gap between uh, kind of the, the most disadvantaged and least disadvantaged. And obviously this reflects uh, policy, uh, food availability, maybe uh, food poverty, the, all of these um, uh, different kind of socioeconomic factors. Now let's look at another example um, where, again, here we're still dealing with, with data that can be considered relatively objective. Uh, but in this instance, we're looking uh, at a case where there's no real clear conversion formula. So we don't have the kind of, you know, inches to millimeters formula like we had previously. The researchers or the processors themselves had to make a decision on how to, to recode data. Um, so this is, again, another piece of work commissioned by Closer um, that aims to harmonize and document a set of variables measuring socioeconomic circumstances from the 1946, 1958, 1970s cohorts and the, the Millennium cohort study. Um, so this, this uh, instance may be a bit more um, challenging or certainly subjective, you know, more, more kind of decisions needed to be made here. The big challenge here was, I guess, the historical range. So, you know, we've got a cohort starting in 1946, uh, all the way up to a cohort starting in 2000, 2001, and kind of the, the Con, you know the, the concepts the ways we measure what we consider socioeconomic status you know has changed so drastically over that um over that time period so if we you know if we look at some of the ways that socioeconomic status particularly focus you know if we look consider occupation as an indicator of socioeconomic status how was occupation classified in these different cohorts um you know, the, the, we have these these kind of uh, different coding schemes 
uh, derived from classification systems used by the Office for National Statistics, um, or as it was previously known, the, the Office of Population Censuses and Surveys, uh, and I believe the, the Registrar General's Office before that. Um, so yeah, unlike the imperial metric choice in the previous example, you know, there's obviously this, this you know, metric, the metric um, system was kind of the, you know, we've got these two, met these two metrics, I guess, imperial and metric, you have to kind of convert one to the other. Which one do you convert to which was a pretty easy decision in the previous example, because obviously the metric system is what we use uh, in, in kind of modern day science and life in general. Um, whereas here, um, it wasn't as straightforward as using the most up to date system, because obviously, as you get kind of further and further apart, these classification systems, they, they kind of change more drastically. Um, so because of that, a final decision was taken to um, recode any data that was that was um, kind of coded either using the, the 70s, 80s, 2000s or, or above, that everything would be recoded to reflect the um, Registrar General's uh, 1990 classification of, of occupation. Again, because it was it was um, kind of the, the the kind of the the middle ground for all of these different classification systems. So um, this project, again, I should have mentioned this was led by uh, Brian Dodgen uh, from Center for Longitudinal Studies and and colleagues there. And um, what they did is they chose to harmonize or create these derived uh, socioeconomic status variables um, at the age 10 and 11 sweeps uh, in these cohorts, because that's kind of where, where these um, variables were measured consistently across the, the four cohorts. Um, and most of these uh, here, they, they relied on a particular type of software um, to, to construct these variables, uh, something called the Cascot software, which is, I think, a, a purpose-built piece of software uh, that can kind of read the occupational codes of, um, of kind of earlier classification systems and find their nearest equivalent in in later classification systems. So this is the type of variable that was uh, produced, again, consistently labeled in the three different cohorts, uh, father socioeconomic uh, status at age 10, 11 sweeps. Uh, here we've got the, the kind of the specific details of how these were, were derived within each cohort and the consistent kind of um, metadata for the, the the kind of the response options in the newly derived variables. So uh, basically settled on a consistent kind of ordered categorical variable ranging from uh, professionals, so your, your doctors, lawyers, management, that type of work, uh, down to, to kind of unskilled um, occupations. So those are two examples of harmonization of objective data, uh, but what about data that aren't objective? So as a psychologist by trade, I often use the term latent variables to describe the things that I'm interested in studying. Uh, as data managers, you probably use different terms, maybe things like scales or measures or indices or things like that. But essentially what I'm talking about here are things we can't measure directly. Um, you know, if you're measuring height and weight, that's straightforward. You, you step on some scales, you get a tape measure out. But, you know, how do we measure things like, uh, you know, attitudes, cognitive ability, mental health, personality? These are things we can't measure directly. But we can estimate these by, you know, asking participants maybe a series of questions or giving them a series of cognitive tasks and then summing responses to form a, a continuous score. So, how do we harmonize this type of data, particularly when different scales um, or, or questionnaires are used in studies? So, you know, this is a very, very common thing uh, in, in, in research in general. You know, there's lots of different questionnaires out there that are, are purported to measure the same thing. Uh, again, being a mental health researcher, um, there's a, there was a paper came out a couple of years ago where they estimated that uh, in the published literature, there are over 300 different scales or questionnaires used to measure depression alone. Um, 
And these these scales, they can, you know, again, they're supposed to be measuring the same things, yet they can differ in, in quite a lot of different characteristics in terms of the, the number of questions they ask, the types of symptoms or questions uh, they, they ask about, the response formats, you know, some might be in different kind of, one might be on a three-point Likert scale, the other might be on a seven-point Likert scale. How, you know, this is very kind of disparate data, even though it's supposedly measuring the same the same types of things. How do we go about combining uh, and harmonizing this? So this is essentially the crux of what I'm going to be talking about today, a very long intro. Um, this is what we, but I, I, again, I think it's important to cover some of those basics of harmonization before we go on to this stuff. Um, so let's let's explore this in a bit more detail. Um, so there are different approaches. If, if we're just thinking in terms of the, the kind of analysis side of things or the processing side of things, there's different approaches, um, each with, with I guess, strengths and, and limitations and depend, you know, different approaches kind of have different levels of, I guess, uh, input that are, that are needed. So, you know, uh, a kind of quick and easy approach uh, you might think would, would be useful would be uh, standard uh, standardization or stand you know can we not just simply standardize this th this data okay so let's say we've got one study where you know we're interested in studying anxiety or if we're data managers we've been asked to prepare some some data on anxiety um you know in one cohort uh you know they use something like the gad7 to measure generalized anxiety disorder in another cohort they use the the bex anxiety inventory you know these these questionnaires they're both measuring anxiety so how about we just you know convert the raw sum scores into you know a standardized z score uh then we have this kind of rank ordering of participants within each cohort and everything's on this this nice similar uh, metric and we can use this then to maybe examine you know associations with with predictors and and outcomes uh, so this is certainly a very feasible and straightforward approach uh, it's done quite often and, and often the, it, again depending on the kind of the context it's, it's fine but there are some limitations to this because it makes a couple of very strong assumptions so one is that uh, the two scales that you're harmonizing this way, uh, you're assuming that they measure exactly the same thing, excuse me, and they measure it um, just as well as one another. Uh, and obviously, given the, the many ways I listed about how these scales can can differ, to me, that seems like quite a large assumption. Um, there's also issues then with, you know, depending on the research question you're interested in. So, uh, if you're looking at kind of broad associations between variables, that, that's fine. But, you know, if you want to compare maybe mean levels, uh, well, obviously, if you're standardizing these measures, if you're converting everything to a, you know, a mean of zero and standard deviation of one, then, then you, you lose that information about the, the mean. So, again, an okay approach if you're in a pinch, but it's certainly not the most comprehensive. Uh, scale calibration is another, I guess, kind of form of harmonization or related to to what we would consider harmonization um and this is a, a very good example of this uh, a paper by by hannah jongsma and uh Pavitha patale and colleagues at cls um basically this this involves taking existing questionnaires okay so say we have the bex in in one cohort the gad7 in another cohort what we do is we go out and we give those two questionnaires to an entirely new sample um, and then we, we have that sample fill out the different questionnaires and then, the, you know, we can apply kind of various methods of, of kind of scale equating. What would somebody get in the BEX depending on their score in the GAD7 and what would somebody get in the GAD7 depending on their score in, in the BEX. Um, and then you can take those kind of formula and take them back to your original data and use it to create these kind of converted scores in both data sets. Um, so again, an, an interesting approach uh, and certainly vi very viable, but it, you know, again, some some issues and limitations. Obviously, it's it's it involves new data collection, uh, which can be expensive, time consuming. You know, really, what we're here today to learn to do is, is you know maximize the reusability of data we already have. And uh, you also, you know, if you're harmonizing a large amount of instruments, this can be quite a quite a burdensome task for participants in this particular paper i think that they, they had them complete oh i don't know seven or you know several questionnaires on all related to mental health 
can be kind of burdensome on participants. Um, and you also then have to assume that the kind of uh, equating solution derived in this population applies to the populations in your in your original data. So the third approach then, and this is the approach that we've taken in the past and the approach that we use in our harmony tool is item level retrospective harmonization. So let's look at another example from uh, the closer projects to, so that I can give you a clear idea of what I mean by item level or question level or variable level harmonization. Uh, this is a project I was involved with uh, a few years back while um, working in, in CLS. Uh, and I was the, the aim of this project was to harmonize common mental health questionnaires from five um, of the, the UK's birth cohorts. So as I mentioned, you know, these questionnaires, uh, you know, they're, they're purported to measure the same thing, but they're, 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 they're obviously different in, in various ways. But if you look at them in terms of the content, we, we often see quite a lot of overlap in questionnaires also. You know, they tend to ask about similar types of things, but the phrasing might be slightly different. So if we look at something like, you know, the Bex and the GAD7, they both have a question in there, you know, have you had uh, something related to inability to, to relax? So in my original harmonization project, what we attempted to do is we, we we tried to map out at the at the item level or at the question level what is the conceptual overlap amongst all of the mental health questionnaires in the, the CLS cohorts. Um, how did we do this? Uh, we used a, a kind of uh, old school uh, expert opinion approach. I don't know if I can consider myself an expert, but I use my, my kind of own opinions and judgment here. Uh, basically what we did is myself and a colleague from the Department of Clinical Psychology in UCL, independently of one another, we went through every single question and every single sweep of the cohorts uh, and tried to assign a kind of core label, a one or two word label to each question, trying to identify, well, what is the core symptom or core concept being measured by this particular question? You know, things like you know, low mood, that would refer to any question that asks, you know, have you been feeling downhearted and blue? Have you been feeling depressed? Have you been feeling miserable? You know, if we read a question like that, we quote it as low mood. Fatigue, you know, questions might ask, you know, oh, I've been feeling very tired recently, or have you been lacking energy? Those types of things. Uh, and basically we used this, we did that kind of independently of one another, and then compared our results to see did we come up with the same kind of harmonized solution. Um, and we found we, we agreed about 80% of the time. Uh, in instances where we didn't agree, we had a third independent reader come in and uh, kind of serve as the, the decision maker. Um, and we used this to produce these types of, of kind of schematics um, uh, like this, or, or well, we use it really to produce this kind of search tool, uh, which was essentially a range of, of kind of filtered Excel files where people could go in, they could take this tool and say, okay, I want to analyze uh, mental health measures in the ALSPAC cohort and the Millennium cohort study. Uh, and you can kind of filter by cohort, by, by question, by age range. Uh, and then we would have the kind of the, the consistent uh, questions listed here. So for instance, in uh, the SF36, they ask a question about low mood. Have you ever felt downhearted and low? Uh, in the MFQ, which is in the ALSPAC, also, you know, they ask questions like, I felt miserable uh, or, or unhappy. So giving researchers, you know, a kind of broad schematic, okay, I want to measure these, uh, I want to harmonize these questionnaires. Um, this helps them identify kind of the most common or the most overlapping items that the, then they can kind of pick out and create their own harmonized subscales. So in other words, let, let's just sum up, create a sub uh, a total score just based on um, the the quite the, the the questions or the items that have the same content. That way we know we're kind of tapping the same underlying things here. So let's again let's clarify that with um with a, a bit of an example uh, of how we actually used this harmonized data. Um, 
So this is a paper uh, led by by David Gondek, um, uh, again formerly of the um, Center for Longitudinal Studies. And what, what we wanted to do here is take some of this harmonized mental health data and just use it to give us some idea of the kind of trajectories of what we call psychological distress, or in other words, kind of mixed depression and anxiety. What does this look like? Um, what are average levels of this look like in the UK population across time? When does when does you know depression, anxiety, when are they likely to peak? Uh, and has this been consistent across these these uh, three different cohorts? So. Again, to give you an idea of the level of consistency in measurements in these cohorts, here's an overview of all the measures of psychological distress, uh, that's again depression and anxiety, that were administered um, just across adulthood in these uh, in these different cohorts. Um, so if you look at this here, you can see, you know, uh, how many different measures do we have? We only have three cohorts. Again, we've got next steps in here, but it only had, it only had one instance, so we couldn't include it. Um, you know, we've got GHQ, Kessler, Malaise in the tree, MFQ, PSE, PSF, SF36. So even within cohorts, if we look at the NSHD, for example, they've used different measures of psychological distress at different kind of assessment ways. So we can scrutinize this, this data and try to pick out, are there points in time where these measures overlap? Uh, and can we kind of harmonize those? And we deduced that if we if we looked at these kind of three broad age periods, so you're kind of mid thirties, early forties, late forties, early fifties, we have this this kind of overlap, and uh, these are the questionnaires that were administered here. So we've got uh, the malaise. There, there's kind of a, sh a longer and a shorter version of the malaise, uh, but the also the the PSE, PSFS, and the GHQ. So we've got these kind of four. Four different scales have been administered uh, across these three cohorts. And if we can harmonize these, it means we have the scope to look at these trends both within the cohorts, uh, but also across cohorts. So what did the, the conceptual overlap look like here? Well, we identified four, um, four questions or indicators that were kind of conceptually similar across these measures. Again, you might think that's not an awful lot, but uh, again, you're kind of unfortunately working towards the lowest common denominator. So, uh, you know, the malaise inventory, even in its its full form in the BCS 70, the maximum number of items we had here, maximum number of questions was uh, was nine. So, uh, yeah, overall, for not not a bad result. Uh, if we look at some examples here, you know, fatigue. So, for instance, in the GHQ, they ask, "Have you been feeling in need of a good tonic?" Uh, which is a, I feel quite an old school expression, but you get the idea there. It's about kind of lacking energy. Have you have there been days in the, in the PSF? Have there been days when you tired out very easily? If we look at the malaise, do you feel tired most of the time? So you can see the kind of conceptual overlap between these these four questions. Um, the, the data, the next problem we came across is, okay, we've identified conceptually similar, a, a subset of conceptually similar items here, but these items had different response scales. They were scored different, differently by, by respondents in the surveys. So, you know, we can't create a, a, a sum score just in their raw format because um, the, the the kind of interpretation of that sum score, the range, the po the possible range will differ considerably uh, across the cohorts. So we have to do something to re to the response format. Um, so here, this is just a, a way I've kind of graphically illustrated our recoding process. Uh, I've kind of got the the harmonized response in the middle, and I'm kind of working left to right for one scale and right to left for for our other scale. Um, again, if you you know, there's there's probably different ways you could you could visualize this, but this is one I find kind of helpful working towards this kind of common goal in the middle. Um, so if we look at say, uh, let's start looking at the malaise inventory. So the response scale for the malaise inventory is very very simple. It's a it's, it's almost like a checklist. You know, it's a do you have this symptom? No or yes. So, for instance, you know, do you often feel uh, miserable or depressed? No or yes. So, the PSF 
S, on the other hand, asks uh, responses on a six-point Likert scale, a kind of frequency scale, uh, you know, never in the last year, every day in the last year. So obviously, if we were to sum up questions on the PSFS, the scores would be much higher. So what we have to do, again, unfortunately, there's this issue of lost information here where we have to kind of work towards the lowest common denominator. So really here, our only choice was to try and binarize the responses um, of the, the PSFS. Um, now, in this case, that was relatively a relatively straightforward thing to do uh, because the Malays asked this kind of never ever kind of scoring uh, system. We decided to, to do something very similar with the PSFS data. And basically we recorded anybody who got a zero. So somebody who said they've never had a particular symptom in the last year were, were again kept as zero. Uh, and basically anybody who noted any presence of symptom uh, was quoted as a one. So now we have this kind of harmonized response in both scales where uh, variables are quoted zero, meaning kind of absence of symptom, one meaning presence of symptom. Um, so that was a, you know, that's an example of kind of a simple algorithm or a, or a kind of common sense heuristic, really, where you only have one option in terms of your recording. But that's not always going to be the case with item level harmonization. You know, if there isn't a clear indication um, of how how you should record data, there's a, there's a couple of different techniques you could employ. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in, in detail. There's a really good paper by uh, Singh. Uh, 2022 again it'll be in the references to this where um they they cover a lot of a lot of these kind of different techniques so one example for instance is using linear stretch um, and this is an approach that sets the maximum scores and the minimum scores of both instruments as equal and then stretches all the scores uh in the middle to be kind of have the same the same distance um, so let's say let's say we have two scales here, and this is what the the responses look like. Uh, in, in questionnaire one, things are scored, uh, you know, from disagree to agree, agree, agree. Uh, I meant to write strongly agree there, but I suppose agree, agree uh, gets the message across. Um, zero, one, two, three. Whereas in the the second questionnaire, we're looking to harmonize. Things are scored on a seven point scale, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so in our example what we would do is we would try and stretch the four point instrument towards the, the seven point scale. Uh, and we do this by multiplying every score of uh, using this formula here where X represents a particular value in the, in the smaller scale. Um, so we would uh, multiply every value of uh, X uh, by six, then dividing by, by three um, and basically scores of, uh, zero, one, two, three would become uh, zero, two, four, and, and six. Again, now we'd have this kind of similar metric to the, to the zero to six score uh, below. Again, just an example. And uh, if you're interested in this type of thing, um, the same article is good to, to read up on. Okay, so step four of uh, the Fortier approach. Um, is, you know, it's important to estimate the quality of your harmonized uh, variables that you've derived. Um, are they equivalent or comparable at least? Um, so one of the ways, again, I'll, I'll, I'll not go into this in too much detail, um, but one of the ways we typically do this as researchers is to, to empirically test for what we call measurement invariance. Um, uh, so measurement and variance, basically assessing whether, uh, given the kind of the, the way the questions are phrased, the response options, are people interpreting these questions in, in the, the same way? Or if you were to kind of control, uh, are there kind of differences in uh, systematic differences in measurement error, basically? Uh, and are, could these be influencing the way people responses? Uh, Responds to questions rather than their kind of true underlying levels of whatever it is you're, you're studying, in this case, psychological distress. So just in summary, what we did is we tested uh, in this particular paper or in the, the harmonization project, we tested uh, the, for measurement invariance using multiple group confirmatory factor analysis. Um, and basically, uh, this is a statistical method where we specify this, this kind of measurement model uh, and fit increasingly 
uh, strict constraints on it uh, across different, whether it's different cohorts or different populations or the same population over time. Basically, we've got two groups and we, we kind of increasingly make the the measurement properties the same across across the two groups and see does that kind of worsen our overall model fit. Um, so there's two parameters really we're, we're interested in here. So first there's the, the factor loadings um, and they represent the, the strength and direction of the relationship between um, observed indicators, in this case the, the specific questions, and the underlying latent factor we're trying to measure, psychological distress. So um, you know, we test to see if, if the loadings uh, are, are kind of equal for each item uh, across the two groups. Um, if they are equivalent, it suggests that the, indi uh, the, the indicators have a, a kind of similar relationship to the underlying construct. Or in other words, they're, they're kind of, um, you know, for instance, in, in cohort one and cohort two here, if we find equivalence of, of this factor loading, um, this would basically tell us that low mood is is equally as good an indicator of psychological distress uh, in, in both cohorts, essentially. Um, if we don't find that equivalence, it suggests that maybe people are interpreting, people from the different groups are interpreting the questions a little bit differently, regardless of their actual level of, of depression. Um, then we, fit, uh, we, we test for the equivalence of uh, thresholds. Uh, and basically the threshold represents the points uh, at which respondents transition from one category to the next in their in their responses so you know what's the a threshold between uh neutral and agree agree and strongly disagree those would be the the thresholds um and again if thresholds are equivalent across groups it suggests that people are, are kind of interpreting the response categories in a similar way um so Again, depending on what level of equivalence you observe here, you can do different things with your data. If your metric invariance or the, the equivalence of loadings is the same, you know, you can make va valid comparisons of associations in the data. So how does psychological distress, how is it related with poverty in uh, one cohort and how is, it how is psychological distress related with poverty in another cohort? You can kind of make that meaningful comparison there. Um, Whereas with the thresholds, if they are found to be equivalent, you can you can make kind of valid comparisons about means essentially is the average level of psychological distress and the average level of psychological distress in cohort one and two. Do they do you know if there's a difference there? Is that difference likely to be down to measurement factors or is it likely to be a kind of a true difference in the actual level of of depression? Um, it's also important to, um, again, I mentioned this kind of trade-off in in loss of information versus comparability. Um, it's also important to to look at how much information you're using. So in this particular project, we can we we looked at you know okay we've got our overall set of items and a harmonized subset of items. What does that mean for kind of the the total amount of information or the reliability? Of, of the data. So here we produced uh, what are called total information functions, um, basically uh, plotting the, the inverse of the standard error. And again, you want to see distributions that are kind of as similar as possible. You know, if, you, you, if you're if you getting a, a sort of smaller or a lower peak in your harmonized data set, that's, that's telling us that we're kind of losing a bit of reliability because we're dealing with a subset of, of items. Um, other things we did, you know, as a validity check, we also uh, we also harmonize or correlated total scores on our subset or harmonized items with our original instruments, just to see, you know, uh, do people have kind of the same rank ordering uh, in the in the smaller subset of items as they would in the overall scale? And again, we found uh, reasonable um, uh, support for that. So, um. How did we actually use this data once we derived these harmonized continuous measures of mental health? Um, so we plotted kind of what were the average trajectories of growth. Uh, and what we see here, so we've got our three different cohorts. The gray line is the average 
um, trajectory of psychological distress. In other words, the average number of symptoms appeared to kind of increase as people uh, went, you know, into kind of late thirties, middle age, uh, peaked around about kind of mid mid fifties, and then started to to decrease over time. And we saw a similar pattern in, in each of the the three cohorts. What does that suggest? It suggests that midlife. Is a, is a kind of particularly stressful time for people. Kind of makes sense. You're probably balancing family life. Maybe you've got caring responsibilities, older parents. You're at the height of your career, I guess, a lot. You're, you're juggling a lot of things. Uh, that That's at least our, our kind of theory as to why we see that trend. But we also see a bit of a cohort difference here where it looks like uh, individuals in the, the kind of the younger generation scored higher or had a higher average number of symptoms than kind of the older um, cohorts. So that is uh, uh, kind of harmony, or, or sorry, that is harmonization uh, in, a, in a nutshell. So I might just very briefly um, pause here to see if we have um, any, any questions. Um, so I see one there uh, from Helena. Uh, is there a common measurement to estimate the quality of the harmonization? Well, I, hopefully I just, that, that question came in about half an hour ago. Hopefully I've answered that, you know, looking at things like the the uh, equivalent um, uh, equivalents of of your instruments, the, the reliability uh, and things like that. Um, so yeah, if there's no other questions, then I'll, I'll proceed to, to talk briefly about harmony. And then I'll pass over to, to uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll, we'll pass over to Thomas. Um, oh, and there is a yes, question in the, in the chat. I do apologize. Something is happening with my camera. I'm now a, a <laughs> this blurb. Um, we have a question in the chat about were population sizes more or less similar? Yes. And in the, in, well, in the, in the, Birth cohorts, they were more or less similar. Yes, there, there, there was uh, the nineteen forty six cohorts slightly, um, uh, slightly smaller number of participants, but obviously we we tried to address things like that, you know, non response through through imputation and and things like that. No, that's fantastic, Owen. It seems we are getting a couple of more questions in the Q&A. Uh, people feel encouraged to ask now that we've we've started the discussion. Um, the first one being all census, census units of the country were listed. Um, yeah, I'm not, I need some more clarification on that question. I'm wondering if that... Um, I'll, I'll look at the, the second question there. While comparing means from different scales, how do we look um, at, at thresholds? Um, okay, so so yeah, so like I said, the comparing the thresholds. If um, if you compare, so so the threshold, like I said, it's it's about what level of the underlying latent traits do you need to be to cross into the kind of the the higher threshold. So first of all, what we do is. We, um, we we test the equivalence of that, kind of hold them equal across different groups and see does that uh, worsen the overall model fit. Um, it, it often does. There are then strategies you can you can take. There's you can test for kind of partial measurement invariance, maybe see if there's a, a small number of those uh, thresholds you can kind of free across groups. That would tell you that, you know, you know, there's some equivalence in the, the kind of the underlying mean levels, but but that that's due to the kind of true differences. But there might also be some influence of measurement differences in there also. So yeah, the whole measurement invariance thing um, is is a huge topic. Lots of different methods, but I can certainly um, point people in the in the right direction for for resources if if they want to learn a bit more about that. Um. No, thank you ever so much, Owen. It might be that the previous question was actually an answer to the question in chat. Um, but you, oh, please okay. feel free to type in another another question, another question for us. But I'll 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 hand over to to Owen for the for the demonstration now. Okay. 
Yes, yes. So uh, let me let me see here. Uh, where I... Apologies, my slides. Okay. Um, so in the previous example, um, which is probably the most more complicated example of harmonization at the at the item level, you could see hopefully that there was a lot of human decisions or researcher degrees of freedom. You know, when screening for the items, uh, matching the content. You know, myself and uh, my colleague Mark Tibber uh, from UCL, we we agreed around eighty percent of the time, which is which is not bad, but it's still quite a lot of error. Uh, obviously, then if we had a, a third or fourth person, then they might disagree with with the kind of the, the items that they felt matched with one another. Um, so there's this this potential for quite a lot of subjectivity and, and kind of human error gets introduced into the mix. Um, and then about two years ago, as uh, AI and, and large language models began to take over the world, uh, Bettina and myself had a conversation about whether uh, these methods could be, you know, uh, these AI methods could be applied to harmonization, basically using LLMs to screen questionnaire metadata and identify potentially harmonizable variables, uh, you know, based on their underlying meaning or semantic contact. Um, and yeah, so we got in touch with with Thomas Wood from Fast Data Science. Uh, Thomas, a, a data scientist specializing in in natural language processing methods, uh, and, and put in an application into Wellcome's uh, Mental Health Data Prize. Uh, and yeah, from that, that's where where Harmony was born. From that that kind of initial small pot of money that that we've we've grown and grown ever since. Um, so yeah, rather than maybe describe the tool, it's probably better if I just kind of dive into it uh, and show you a live demonstration. Um, so before I go into the tool, I'm gonna to bring up our, our website. Uh, so you can uh, scan the QR code here or go to harmonydata.ac.uk. Uh, it'll take you to our, our website uh, where we've got lots of useful resources. Uh, we've got various kind of uh, news items, blogs, uh, community features, case studies of Harmony being used. Uh, we've got lots of, uh, like I said, helpful researchers, uh, uh, resources, so uh, frequently asked questions, user guides, uh, and, and things like that, and a bit of background information um, as well. So yeah, uh, you can also sign up to our mailing list, which will be great. I'll be talking about that a little bit, or Thomas might mention this towards the end. Uh, we're always looking to kind of develop the tool further. So if anybody's interested in getting involved, uh, join our join our mailing list. But uh, so now I'll, I'll click on the actual tool itself. So if we click try Harmony, um, it should bring up our um, interface hopefully the live demo is always a very scary prospect due to uh you know it issues but yeah here we go uh i'm gonna refresh that okay so this is our harmony two Um, this is what our, our interface looks like, uh, quite quite user friendly uh, and, and you know um, minimalist. Uh, we've got a, kind of some some troubleshooting or, or kind of guidance on the side, but again you can get that on the website. Um, so basically, uh, if so, if we look here, we can see we've got a, a couple of different kind of questionnaires preloaded. If you wanted to to look at them as as examples, but basically the way Harmony works is you can either upload or simply drag and drop files uh, into the tool. Um, files can be in, in PDF, CSV, text, uh, Word documents, um, Excel, lots of different lots of different examples. We've got some kind of good examples of, of you know how, how you can maybe format these to make sure that that harmony can can read them as as efficiently and you don't have to kind of de delete things um, out but I'll, I'll show an example um so let's say here we've got some uh excel sheets here for instance so say i am a researcher or a data manager i want to harmonize some mental health data across two uh, longitudinal surveys. In one survey, they measure depression and anxiety with uh, the SES-D 
Uh, and in another, they use the um, GHQ12. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just drag and drop these in to uh, the tool. So Harmony kind of parses these, it, it reads them, and then it extracts the, the questionnaire content. So we can see there the, the 50, 20 items in the CSD. Uh, I have the GHQ stored in a separate data file because obviously when we're downloading our metadata, they're usually in different, different kind of questionnaires or different files. I'm going to drag and drop that in also. Okay, and you'll see now down here, we've got the GHQ items have been have been extracted. If there's any issues with, you know, um, formatting or if Harmony, if it reads in a bit of text, maybe that it shouldn't, maybe the blurb at the start of your, your questionnaire, you know, you can just, you can just uh, drop, um, drop those things there. You can also manually add in uh, different questionnaire items. So, okay, we've got our, our metadata imported into Harmony. Uh, the next, all we have to do is hit harmonize. Okay, so this is our, our results. Uh, before I, I talk about them in depth, uh, we'll start having a look at the at the threshold here. So basically, harmony, the way it works is it, it takes every combination of items in your two questionnaires and calculates a similarity score based on the, the underlying meaning. Um, so in the background, it calculates everything. Uh, by default, it only visualizes kind of the highest matching items. Uh, and you can kind of play around with this threshold to basically just to tell which which items to to visualize. Um, by default, it's it's I think it's seventy, which is maybe a bit high based on some of the the work we've been doing. We find when we when you set it down to about fifty, um, it it uh, performs quite well. Um, so let's look at the the results over here. I'll, I'll talk about the similarity index in a minute and how it's actually calculated what it is. But basically, in a, in a very simple way. Uh, it's a bit like a correlation coefficient. Zero would mean there's absolutely no relationship between the the, the pair of questions you're looking at, and a hundred would mean they're literally word for word exactly the same. So we can see here, looking at the says D, um, the says uh, and GHQ twelve in the says D, there's a question that asks participants to to respond to the to the statement I felt depressed. Uh, in the GHQ twelve, we've got been feeling unhappy and depressed. I was happy feeling reasonably happy, all things considered. Um, I enjoyed life, been feeling reasonably happy, all things considered. There's a question around here, you know, my sleep was restless. Have you lost much sleep over worried, uh, over worry? What is interesting, what Harmony can also do is it, it, it is some ability to, to, to detect kind of antonyms. So we can see here this question, I had trouble keeping my mind on what I was doing. Uh, we've got a, a similarity score of 61, but it's negative. Uh, because in this question, the, the question is phrased positively. I have been able to concentrate on what I'm doing. So you can see here, Harmony, it, it gives you this, this list of how, you know, where and to what degree all of the questions from these two instruments um, overlap. You can look at kind of uh, matches within instruments if you want. So if I wanted to look at, well, how do all of the says D items compare to one another? Um, I can I can click that. Um, you can, um, it, again, if there's, you can still obviously use your, your kind of expert opinion and judgment. If something's flagged up here that you, you think maybe you don't agree with, you don't think it's a it's a correct match, you can kind of uh, report it and and remove it from your um from your results. And you can export uh your data into a, a CSV file. Basically if you want a, a large matrix of all of these similarity scores, if you've got uh if you've ways maybe you can think of visualizing them or or doing some extra um worker or processing. Um, so that is the, the tool in its, uh, oh, 
We also have a, a kind of a search function here. So maybe if you're dealing with quite a, a very large document of metadata, maybe an entire code book or something like that, uh, and you wanted to, to just uh, search for, for items related to uh, depression, for instance, you can, you can do that and you can see it, it kind of filters, filters like that. Um, one of the, the things on the kind of agenda was to discuss kind of the, the integration of Harmony with other um, with other platforms. So I'm going to skip ahead maybe a, a little bit uh, and show an example of that. So we've uh, we've integrated this tool with uh, Louise Arsenault's catalog of mental health measures. So uh, those of you who aren't familiar, there's a fantastic resource. Uh, let's see, I'll hit search studies. So basically Harmony, once it's done its harmonization, it can link back to the catalog. Uh, the catalog of mental health measures, a, a big database of, of kind of item level metadata of longitudinal surveys in the UK, particularly those that capture mental health data. Um, and it will basically take you to uh, back to the catalog and show you other data sets that have uh, similar similar types of, of variables. So you can see here, uh, this has taken us into the catalog to help with uh, a bit of discoverability, really. You know, it might, might point you in the direction of data sets you weren't aware of that would potentially be, be harmonizable. Um, What's a, a relatively recent feature as well is now these two platforms talk to one another, or in other words, you can actually take data from uh, the mental health catalog and export it directly into um, Harmony. So let's say something like, okay, I wanna, let's look at this revised children's uh, manifest anxiety scale. I want to harmonize this with a with a particular questionnaire. You can click the little harmony icon, which will take you from the catalog back into into harmony, uh, and you can see it's it's kind of imported the instrument the the particular questionnaire content here. So now let's let's harmonize this with um, I don't know one of our kind of preloaded questionnaires, perhaps. Okay, one of our preloaded questionnaire isn't loading today. Apologies, live live demos always uh, always something. But you can see there that uh, yeah, I think it's just really struggling to cope with my my browser while while sharing. Uh, yeah, but you can again just take things directly from the catalog into Harmony and and hit harmonize there. So um, that is the the web tool. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what Harmony, uh, how it works, I guess, uh, what's going on uh, underneath the hood, and I'll put my video back on for this, but I think. Okay. So what is going on underneath the hood and how do we kind of interpret the, the output from, from Harmony? Harmony. So um, Harmony is built in Python and uh, it uses natural language processing to identify questionnaire variables um, that are conceptually similar. So first, uh, it, it obviously processes the PDF to, to get the question items out. Uh, and then it uses a transformer transformer neural network. Um, so basically the text of each question is converted into a numerical vector in high dimensional space. So you know, we could be talking thousands of dimensions. Um, and then the distance between any two questions is then uh, measured according to something called the cosine similarity index. So basically this is the score of how kind of con conceptually similar the strings of, of texts are. Um, and unlike earlier LLMs, which assign similarity based on uh, how common words co-occurred with one another. The transformer neural network um, takes kind of context into account. It uses an attention mechanism, which um, is a, a component that, that uh, causes it to pay extra attention to words in the sentence, which are, are, are strongly linked to 
to kind of the, the target world and, and does that iteratively. Um, so basically two sections, you know, if they're similar in meaning, in meaning, even if they're worded differently or even in different languages, something I probably should have highlighted by now is, is Harmony can, can do this across lots of different languages also. Um, if they're similar in terms of meaning, they'll be, they'll be placed close together. Um, evaluating Harmony, how do we know that it actually works, that it produces good and reliable results? Uh, uh, we're kind of running short for time here, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Um, basically, we looked at how how well could Harmony reproduce the the kind of the expert opinion matching that my that myself and my colleague from from clinical psychology in UCL um, did, and we found that <clears throat> we tested a range of different um, NLP models uh, and found the best results uh when using something called the the sentence bert model it is kind of an open source uh alternative to, to something like chat gpt um and we found it agreed with with our kind of human matches uh again strangely about 80 percent of the time which was about the the degree with which we as, as humans agreed with one another uh but again these models the kind of the underlying models are, are kind of continually improving so we think that accuracy will, will only increase we also wanted to, to conduct some some kind of follow up tests. Uh, one way we devised of testing how how reliable the sources are were to, or how reliable the the results were, was to look at how do how do the matches uh, identified by Harmony how do they parallel real world correlations? So basically, what we did is we got access to some large population data. Um, a survey from 2022, just, just after the COVID uh, sort of tail end of the pandemic. Um, and this survey was about 2,000 people and they had completed five mental health measures. So what we did was we had 39, I think, unique questions and we calculated a correlation coefficient in the actual real world data for every pair of questions in that big survey. We then fed all the metadata, the questionnaire metadata into Harmony and produced a, a, a cosine score for each um, for each pair of items. So this was what our data set looked like. We had a kind of real world correlation data and the cosine score produced by Harmony. Uh, and what we found is we were actually able to pre uh, predict um, what the, the real world correlation would be between two pairs of items just using our harmony cosines. Uh, we, we would be able to predict this um, using, a, using a regression model and we were able to do that with quite a high degree of accuracy. So again, that that's adds some um, kind of support to the, to the general model underneath. Um, we don't just have, uh, it's not just a web interface. If those of you who are interested in, or who use R frequently, uh, we have our own R package, Harmony Data. Uh, it's up on the CRAN, so you can download and and uh, play around with that. Uh, basically, with this uh, similar functionality to the web browser, you can, uh, at the moment, um, the, the kind of the question text needs to be entered kind of uh, manually. Uh, we're working on on doing more kind of automated, you know, from uh, web URLs and and files on your your hard drive. Uh, but at the moment, uh, you can use the package like this. So say here, I've got two questions out questionnaires: the PHQ nine, the GHQ twelve. Um, I can enter the the content as, as kind of two different uh, lists. Uh, I then append these these instruments. And I can use the match instruments function to, to basically do the harmonization process. So let's see. So that produces um, uh, uh, the match in the, in the form of a list. So there's lots of different bits of information in here. So for instance, the instruments, the, the questions, the, <clears throat> the cosine similarity. Um, we've got a little bit of code here that can help uh, produce this as a, as a kind of data frame or a matrix that we, uh, most of us might be, uh, particularly as researchers, we would be interested in, in using. Um, so it looks something like 
uh, like this. So we can see each question in, in kind of matrix form. So obviously the first question from the PHQ is going to have a perfect cosine similarity score because it's the same question. Uh, and then it gives you a cosine score for each kind of uh, combination of questions in the in the data. So uh, again, going through that quite quickly, but there's lots of documentation on our website and also in the um, in the the, the CRAN uh, as well, if you're interested in in that. So I think um, shall we pause here for a brief uh, maybe ten minutes or so, and then I'll hand over to um, Thomas. Hi everyone, um, welcome back. So um, after Owen's talked through the R library, I'm just going to do a brief demo of of the Python library. So um, if you prefer to code in Python and you want to do some kind of data harmonization or analysis, you can also go to our, our website. And if you scroll down, there are resources for you to use if you want to use Harmony, not just in the browser, as Owen demonstrated, but also in Python or R. So there's example bits of code here. So in the case of Python, um, the source code of how Har Harmony works, everything, every bit of code that it's based on is here on our GitHub and people are, um, you know, are contributing to it um, as an open source project. And if you would like to, to try it, then there's some examples like a, a notebook which you can run in Google Colab. So this is one of the easiest ways of getting started with it. You just go down here, click on Google Colab notebook. And then if you have a Google account, it just runs. You don't need to install anything on your computer. You can also download this and, and run it in Jupyter Notebook on your own computer. So I'm just gonna demonstrate this. So I, I've opened it and I have to just give it permission to run. I run this command, the pip install, and that will install Harmony from, from PyPy, from the Python package repository. I'm also going to install matplotlib, which is this graphing program, which just helps us do, do a few plots. And now I can import Harmony. So, um, and we'll just check which version of Harmony we've got. So we've got version 101. And then I'm going to create an instrument. So this is just showing you how simple it is to create an instrument and pass it to Harmony. So um, I'm going to um, use GAD7, which is a, um, yeah, the standard measure, one of the standard measures for anxiety. And I've got the Norwegian version, or at least the first two questions of that, just to demo how Harmony can handle different languages. So I'm just going to create that. Now I've got a new instrument. We can have a look at it and see, see what's inside it. So this is how Harmony represents an instrument. I've also got the SSD and the GAD7 in Portuguese. So I'm gonna put, put all of these three instruments together. And then I just call this match instruments function. I get all my questions back and the similarity values. I can have a look inside them. These are the text of all my questions. So these first few ones are the SSD. Then we got the GAD7 in Portuguese. And then we've got my two items that I just manually added, which were from the GAD7 in Norwegian. And I, I can view the similarity values that come back. So it comes back as a matrix, which is not particularly human readable. So what I can also do is, is plot it as a graph. Um, so this is a heat map showing that similarity matrix. So like Owen pointed out a moment ago, um, the diagonal, this the diagonal represents comparing a question with itself. So the values in the diagonal are always one, so they're shown as white. And um, strong, I guess, strong positive values will be shown as hot colors and strong negative values as very dark colors. So that lets you see instantly, um, get an idea for where, where the correlations are. Um, also, a lot of the time, people using this have asked us how to generate a crosswalk table. So a table of the matching. So here I'm arbitrarily setting the threshold to 0 0.6. I could put it on 0 0.5, which is what Owen used in the demo just now. And I can just ask Harmony to generate us a crosswalk table. And here now I've got a list of, you know, um, question one. So each pair has been given an ID. We've got question one from uh, from one survey matches question six from another one, and the text and the match score. 
and all of that has come back as a data frame, I can then save that to Excel or CSV or do whatever I want with it. So that's using Harmony from Python. What we've also got, if I go back to the website, is down here we've got an API. So you can run Harmony as an API on your own computer. In fact, I'm going to start that now um, because it takes about a minute to start up. So I've got the Python code just here locally on, on my computer, and it, it just launches. Um, and that's and now I can go to this address, zero or localhost or zero 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 slash docs, and I can then see that this is kind of an online documentation that lets me see all the things that Harmony's API does. So the the API is a computer running somewhere in our case on in the Ulster University, and if you have a harmonization, you send it to Harmony as a a bunch of texts and Harmony will do the calculations and send you the responses. So um, this is the one that's running on my computer. There's also the one that's running on Ulster University here. Um, and that's at this address, api.harmonydata.ac.uk forward slash docs. So the first thing that it can do is there's a, there's a pause endpoint. So I can what I can do is I can click try it out and try any of these. And this is sending it um, a PDF file. And what Harmony will do is it will pull out the values in it. So it's showing me the questions that it's found. So we've got the GAD, this was a PDF of the GAD7 that I sent it, and it will show me the questions that it brought out and then things that it found inside, you know, other things like if, they, if it detects question options, it will add them in here as well. And then um, the other thing that the API does is this matching. So um, there's also a nice handy example that you can do with this try it out. So I can click execute. All of this is public. You don't need any login to, to play around with it. And what I get, this is this is the, um, the command that I would be sending to the, to the URL. So you can do this in the console, whether you're using Windows, Mac, or Linux. What I can do is I can open a terminal. So in Mac, that's a control, like Apple Shift D or something like that. And um, I can paste this command in, and I get all the harmonization values back from Harmony. If I want to do this from from any language other than Python or R, I can also quite easily convert what I've just done. So I can I use this website called curlconverter.com, and then here you can see I'm sending what I'm sending to Harmony. I'm sending this command to the to the URL. So this is, this is the, the address of the server that's running Harmony, and I can send it my instruments. So I'm sending it GAD7 English, and I'm sending it these questions. So question number one of the GAD7 has this text, and these are the question options. Question number two of the GAD7 has this text, and these are the question options. And, and then I'm sending it GAD7 Portuguese. Question number one, that's the text. So that's the intro text, and these are the options in Portuguese, and so on. And then I'm also sending it that I want which large language model I'd like it to use. And I can then turn this to something that I can run in Python, something that I can run in R, or in any of these other languages. So the, because we've got an API, any language, any co coding language, no matter which one you use, can communicate with Harmony. So if you have somebody that, that uses Perl or, or C Sharp, this website, you know, combining it with with the Harmony API allows you to use whatever you want to use and get your results back. So, um, so the result that came back from this harmonization that I just did is um, this response where I've got, let's find the response. Yeah, um, there's a, let's find where that is coming back, text and match, yeah. So, so the value coming back is going to be a big matrix with loads and loads of numbers in. So first, initially the questions, and then at the end, we've got the similarity matrix. Um, with, so because I sent it four questions, I've got 16 values back. And so th this would be the matrix. And you can see the values on the diagonal are, are pretty much equal to uh, equal to 1. So there's 0 0.9999. And that's, that's the, uh, the API. So you can, yeah, you can either run it locally on your own computer, or you can visit the API um, online, and you can make your applications communicate with it. So 
um, somebody in the IT department of your organization would know what to do with it and how to make everything talk to Harmony. So basically the API is there to, to allow everything to, to talk to this application and get the, you know, get the information out that it's able to calculate. So um, moving on from the API, um, well, I'm also going to show you just briefly talk about how Harmony is is working. So um, so it's an open source project, like I mentioned, and um, and the GitHub is on the, at this URL, which we're also going to share in the chat, github.com forward slash Harmony data. So anybody around the world is welcome to contribute to the project. It is uh, free for people, researchers in any field around the world to use, or people in commerce or really any field that would benefit from it. There's no restrictions. The license of all our software is the MIT license. That is a very permissive license, which means you're allowed to take Harmony and use it for something, and you're not forced to put your changes back on the project. You're not forced to, you know, to do anything. Um, so some open software licenses are a bit restrictive in terms of how you're allowed to use it or forbid commercial use and things like that. In our case, we've made it as open po as possible. So it's entirely a public good. Um, it's not been monetized. And uh, we've been encouraging the community to contribute to it. So we've run in-person hackathons, we've run online hackathons, and we have made this GitHub repository discoverable on online. So people who are interested in joining in a project like this and contributing to it, they can go and look at all the issues that need to be solved. For example, recently somebody re um, requested that we add this feature to generate a crosswalk table because they found that that was missing. And so I added that as a ticket, as something that needs to be solved. Somebody picked it up, implemented it, and now that's in the demo that I just showed. So that's really nice that the project is evolving under its own steam and uh, and people are contributing, people are joining and contributing in other senses when they use it in their research and let us know what's missing or how it could be improved. So it's really up to the community of users and developers which direction it, it goes in and what features get added. Um, we are currently um, exploring integrating with a number of platforms. So we've already connected with the API of the six platforms I have listed on the left, which is UKDS, HDR UK, ADR UK, and the Mental Health Catalog, which was the one that Owen connected to just now, UK LLC and Closer. So we are already able to pull data from those catalogs and we're working on setting up a bi-directional integration. Um, we're exploring other data sources, um, which um, ideally have APIs that we're able to connect to so we can pull uh, metadata around studies on those um, on other catalogs. Um, we've also been in contact with a group in the University of Sydney in Australia. Their, um, their task has been to, to gather or they've been assembling a catalog of longitudinal studies on psychological distress in that have been run in Australia and they've sent us their data set and they'd like us to integrate that into the Harmony. So, so we're kind of building up collaborations around the world and starting to turn Harmony into a bit more of a catalog. So in the future, the ideal um, architecture would be a, a bi-directional bi interchange of information via APIs, like the API I just showed you between Harmony and all these other data sources, which would be great and really, you know, really nice for researchers to use. Um, we are working on uh, on the design of Harmony. So we welcome anyone to join in our co-design process and to help us work on not just the functionality of Harmony, but also its appearance. So there are activities and things like hackathons running on that in that area as well. That is also on the, on the website. So if I go back to our homepage, there you can sign up to our mailing list and to the newsletter, and you will find information about about that, how you can join in the in the co-design. Um, yeah, so um, we're now exploring outside of uh, longitudinal studies and, uh, and psychology, which was what we originally developed. That was the kind of the original narrow scope of the tool. So people have been in contact with us around usages, using, using Harmony for 
different fields. So one of them is market research. It's very common in market research to find surveys and questionnaires being run so uh, by you know large organizations such as Ipsos, where they might ask um, people questions around voting preferences or around their opinion about the packaging of this or that product. And so I've had a few conversations with people who need to harmonize data sets that that have been um, gathered you, you know, in the commercial setting around, you know, here, here's this old coffee jar. We made a new coffee jar with a new shape. How do you like it? And then there'll be answers on a Likert scale. And then they will have asked a similar question in a different country, and then they need to combine it. Um, in the pharma industry, there are things that need to be harmonized. So one of the obvious ones is endpoints. So clinical trials are often run. Um, and um, in addition to measuring things like people's blood pressure or mortality rate or, or overall survival, um, quite often things that people will measure quality of life using patient reported measures. So using a questionnaire that has to be filled up or um, yeah, there, are, yeah, there are a number of things that are measured in, the, in, in clinical trials using forms and using things that are written in plain text that later on need to be combined and harmonized. Um, in finance, you have, you know, data sets where things like industry, nobody agrees on how to report industry, how to categorize companies by industry. There's a UK standard, there's a US standard, uh, but there's no universally agreed standard. So things like harmonization arise in all kinds of fields. Um, and we're always interested in hearing from, you know, if you have something in your field of work that you would uh, you would be able to share with us, we'd be really interested to hear about that, applica uh, that application as well. Um, here are a few of the references uh, that have been referred to in the talk so far. So th that, there's no need to go into it, into it in detail, but it will be circulated with the presentation at the end of the talk. And um, that's, that comes, bring us, us to the end of what I was going to present. So thanks very much for listening. The URL is here again, um, display for you, harmonydata.ac.uk. We can, you can also communicate with us on Discord. We have an active Discord server where people write messages and discuss how the tool is working in their research and what features they'd like to add and, and so on. So that's kind of a kind of open dialogue. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn, GitHub, Twitter, and Blue Sky. And Owen's email and my email are here at the bottom. And you can also scan this QR code to get in contact with us. Um, thanks very much for listening. Um, that's that's the end of the talk. Here. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you very much, Owen. This has been fantastic, and I have seen Owen. You've already answered some some Q and A's directly in the in the in the Q and A box. That that's great. Is there anything you would like to to add to the answers for the Q and A's or to highlight? Um, I guess you know some some of the, some really good questions in there um, around kind of you know functionality of the tool uh, and I guess the the answers the answer is quite similar to a lot of them uh, in in that the tool we're continuing to develop it all the time so you know some one of the questions in there was about kind of matching multiple instruments at once um and you know that that's something we're we're working on and and i guess trying to figure out how best to visualize that um one of the questions was about you know the the robustness checks uh you know measurement equivalence that that you know does harmony do that also um currently currently no um <laughs> Again, there it, it's something we we've considered in the past, but one of the advantages of the tool in its current format is uh, we're only using metadata, so there's no kind of issues around kind of data security or that you know people aren't uploading their actual data, the numbers <laughs> directly into into Harmony. We're just dealing with PDFs and questionnaires, so that will be one issue we'd have to overcome. Um, but I guess we, you know, we we always try to point people in the right direction of of you know how do you conduct these re uh, those additional checks, you know, the robustness checks and stuff like that. So we have materials on the on the website. Um, some of the the reports we've done in the past cover cover stuff like that. Um, so again, harmony, you know, like I said, harmonization itself is a very broad term, and it's it's um quite a detailed process i think hopefully that came across today there there are lots of different steps to it 
and you know harmony itself is is a tool really in its current format to, to help with with one particular but very very important aspect of harmony or of harmonization which is how do we find those, those kind of candidate items and you know rather than just kind of people you know screening questionnaires and going, oh that kind of looks like that that kind of looks like that you know given given that really key stage an element of kind of an empirical element and a kind of reproducible element to that uh, that that's what the the tool is is for so i think yeah i mean broadly look we, we've got lots of things there our discord or or all of our forms of communication we're, we're constantly running things like hackathons for instance um we've got some uh, hackathons running at at the moment um again there's details on on the website we're always looking for people to get involved and help us improve the tool so hopefully some of the things people people raised we can identify in future a lot of questions about you know can it be used for this type of data can it be used for that type of data at the end of the day any any text based data can be fed into harmony now it is specifically set up to to read kind of <clears throat> question like data so it's not just mental health it's not just attitude you know it could be anything that's phrased in the form of a survey question uh it, it will it will pick out now what it won't do is you know if you, you you put in say two um papers that describe studies or something like that you know it won't tell you okay study a does this study b does does that and tell you kind of about similarities between studies it's it's, it's mainly at the, the kind of the item level within studies um so yeah there was a there was a question um about that but um yeah i, I don't know does anybody we have a few minutes are there any other final questions or does anybody want to um kind of I don't know. Do we have time for live questions, or if anybody has anything to to add, we'd love to hear from from people. We do have nine minutes left, so plenty mm -hmm. of time for for a couple of more questions. This has been so insightful, and once again, we're we're so grateful to the to the Harmony team for for joining us today. Again, I think there's so much usability for your tool, and it's just going to make the life of data managers so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, you know, one one of the things we'd be particularly keen to hear about is, you know, things that that the data managers can can say. Oh, maybe I could use it for this. Maybe, you know, so we one of the things we we discussed um, when we were speaking with um, Ida Sanchez, uh, uh, and one of the issues she highlighted was, well, maybe if if a data manager is describing data and isn't sure where to categorize certain variables uh with it you know maybe harmony could could sort of say well this variable is quite similar to these variables maybe they could be grouped together in 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 that way when describing the, the kind of the metadata again it was just one um one one example of a kind of novel use yeah i think even like hearing from people that are still here whether a they found this useful and also whether they already see any ways that harmony could help them or if there's anything missing that mm -hmm. so that harmony could help them in the future then that would be really helpful for us because then we can try and sort of integrate that as well yeah i see somebody in the chat said can we send emails uh and yes. the answer is yes of course <laughs> uh, that's why all of these you know we're, we're easily contactable either through the website those email addresses just just drop us a line we're always looking to to hear from people uh, like i said we've already had people from from different parts of the world germany australia getting involved and actually taking the tool because all of our code everything's kind of all on github and, and sort of taking it and maybe adapting it for new purposes or adding additional functionality uh, and things like that that's already happening so yeah we're really keen to kind of build that um build that kind of community around this No, and thank you so much. We're getting such fantastic feedback in the in the chat as well. Everyone is is thankful and grateful for the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we're 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 most grateful as well. We do have a new a new question in the yes. Q and A. Yes, it, it does. Harmony work for questions in different languages. Uh, yes, absolutely, it works. Uh, Thomas, do you have a, a track a, a, an idea of how many languages we can? Yeah, so um, we did have a. 
I have a, a bit of experimentation. Um, let's, let me find this. We've put this on our on our website. So we tried a few of these websites, a few, a few of these languages, and oh yeah, here I've made a graph of um, how well it did. I mean, so it's not like a really really rigorous comparison, but the GAD seven, something like that, the GAD seven is really useful to test because it exists in many, many languages as an official translation. So just checking how well does Harmony match all the items, you can kind of quantify its performance. So overall, kind of the bigger the language, the better it performs. But um, if your language is not in the list, so you can see like, um, yeah, like, yeah, even, yeah, let's see, Canada and yeah, small, yes, languages from outside Europe Sometimes it doesn't perform so well. If um, that is the case, um, the other thing that I didn't go into detail about is we've taken our um, large language model from this website called Hugging Face. So Hugging Face is basically the go-to catalog in the world of large language models outside of things like OpenAI, which are closed source. So they kind of exist only in, you know, in a private, private company, privately owned company. So Hugging Face, pe people will take models and they will maybe take an English one and adjust it for their language. So there are um, kind of initiatives to cover all of the world's languages, including smaller languages. And so I took one for Shona, which is a language in Zimbabwe, and I tried putting it into Harmony, and it could work fine. So um, yeah, so the short answer is out of the box. It works in major languages. If you want to make it work, in any other language, provided that language exists here. So, you know, so like you can try looking here and even for this for this language, we've got what seven models available on a hugging base and you could take one of them, try it and and test it out. So it, the possibilities are pretty endless in terms of covering languages. Um, when you're a bit off the beaten track in terms of the large ones, then you might have to go and take take something from hugging face. But we've Put instructions on how to do that on our website as well. Then you can always contact me if you get stuck. Brilliant. Lots of comments in there about people, and their data resources, and and uh, yeah, potentially reaching out. Which, uh, yeah, that's that's great to see. So many people have interest in it. Yeah. We didn't mention that we're also um, trying to fine tune our own model. So we have a challenge online where we are we're offering a, a prize in vouchers for somebody who can improve harmony and make it work better on mental health data. So because there are language, there are most of the models are tr trained on things like um, the Wall Street Journal or the BBC. So texts that are very, you know, news oriented or finance oriented. And that's not necessarily what you want for psychology or mental health data. So, so there are a few mental health specific models on Hugging Face. There are a huge number of medical models and some legal models. And so we would like to kind of make one for Harmony. And that's something that we're inviting people around the world to just join in and contribute on that as well. So you can find that on our website too. Now we're never so grateful that everyone is sharing their own different tools um, as well. And everyone saying, oh, we'll get in touch. So um, this has been a, a very successful event with a lot of collaboration across across parties. So that's that's fantastic. And thank you ever so much once again for, for you being so open to, to everyone emailing you. You'll probably get an influx. <laughs> of emails uh, in the in the coming week so um but any questions um please please do get in touch once again a, a huge thank you to the harmony data team and a huge thank you to everyone that joined us today um you have been ever so engaging um, and thank you for sharing your tools as well